Well, I'm Joshua, and I'm an INTP, and first and foremost, I would like to say thank you for viewing this video and subsequently visiting my channel. The topic of this video will be on behavior, and the reason I want to talk about this um, uh, subject is because I think that it's um, paramount for me to flesh out what I um, uh, understand and know about human behavior from an evolutionary um, neuroscientific and cognitive science um, standpoint, also based on um, cognitive behavioral um, uh, theory. No matter what you want to think about um, CBT and its applications, at least in the things that it's been shown to be capable of from experimental uh, results, there's a, a great number of items of literature and observation in terms of um, the uh, in, in terms of psychological um, uh, publications and um, various other um, uh, things that I've been able to glean from uh, Yock Pinksup's work, B.S. Skinner and um, Jordan B. Peterson and um, uh, Steven Pinker and a number of um, uh, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and neuroscientists. So, with, and it will explain why I take the approach that I do towards um, uh, my exposition on any personality type. So without further ado, this is on behavior. And it's the case that human behavior from, uh, well, animal behavior is where I would like to start because I fundamentally, being an evolutionary thinker, think consider human beings to be another representation of animal within the animal kingdom, uh, within the spectrum of the animal kingdom. And so it's the case that I want to talk about animal behavior. Animal behavior is fairly instinctually based, but it's the case that as you, um, uh, I would say, go up the tiers of the hierarchy, hierarchy of uh, animals in terms of uh, mammals per se, you get various degrees of freedom from um, uh, different instinctual templates for behavior. In instincts are... Um, uh, action potentials that are embedded within the body that are sort of just um, uh, feed it up through the brain and the spine so that you get the organism to respond in a set way in a reliable way to certain stimuli within the environment. A good example of this is just a reflex and it's the case that all animals have various given reflexes. Mice are a great example from looking at experiments that Yak Pinksep has done, from looking at experiments that Skinner has done, and even doing some experiments on my own to the sh probably to the um, disapproval of PETA because I just needed to see these things for myself. If you take a mouse or a rat and put them in the environment where there is a predatory cat, they freeze up and they don't move until their nose wafts around for a second and can make out whether or not the predator is within that environment. And if you make it, because I've done this experiment a few times, if you make it the case that they have no option to retreat, they're just going to stay frozen. If they have the opportunity to retreat from the environment, they're going to retreat from the environment and only move out of their little local safe zone that they know the predator isn't in to investigate the environment to see if predator is there. If predator is there, they expand the territory of the of their, I guess, immediate fear and panic to the experience to um, uh, see what can be scoped out from their exploration. They become frightened and they explore, but if the predator is in the environment, they stay frozen like a stone and they hope that it can't see them because the cat is made to understand when things are moving laterally within its scope of vision and even if it can smell the mouse or the creature it may not honestly begin its attack if it doesn't see the darting action and so I've seen this and this has been recorded um, in other less I've seen this in live setting and this these sorts of things have been recorded in less um, uh, I guess ethically um, uh, damning settings and so it's the case that why the mouse responds like that when you're looking at that sort those sorts of behavior those are very much so instinctually based they just come with the creature 
as a means of its um, uh, propagation throughout time in terms of its evolutionary history. In order for it to survive, in order for all of the mouse or the rats to have come to the point where this one has been, it has been necessary for them to have these modules of uh, behavior. And you can find various modules in all species of animals, and human beings aren't different. And we call these ready we call these ready-made action potentials, or we call these modules um, instincts or reflexes or behaviors. Whatever. They're instinctual patternizations. And they're there in and they're there in animals. Now when we're looking at other factors in terms of well animals have problem solving modalities to them as well especially rats and especially um, uh, predatory um, animals and uh, predatory mammals and um, uh, Most predatory creatures, I mean from, uh, I don't know where the buck stops, basically, because it's not like I've looked at all, uh, all, an all insects, birds, lizards, and, um, uh, mammals, uh, and just sussed out whether or not what, like, what the litany, I, I shouldn't say litany, but what the repertoire of behaviors that they have. Um, uh, by way of their evolutionary um, uh, history, or just in terms of you know experimental settings. I mean, I'm pretty sure like there's things that a weasel could come up with that um, uh, a dog would not bother to come up with. But it's just a case. I don't know the problem-solving capacities of every um, uh, creature, so I shouldn't say that this is a general statement. But from what I can tell and what I can infer. It's the case that most predatory um, animals have a kind of um, uh, behavioral variance to them that can be mapped on basically by um, uh, geographical um, uh, regions. And so what I mean by mapped on is that you can show that, well, if you see this kind of behavior, it's because there's this type of creature that they're hunting in this region there are these types of obstacles and there are these types of barriers in terms of their um, being able to uh, access the um, uh, creature or um, a mate, if you will. And so you find variation in terms of the overall behavior, even from species to species, in um, uh, predatory mammals. And even ones that aren't predatory for what I just said previously, like maybe for geographical regions you have that um, uh, mate selection finds itself to be um, in dire straits and so in order for the creature to overcome this they have to add on some sets of behaviors that don't come that doesn't come with the general uh, model of their um, uh, instinctual variances or instinctual patternizations and so you have in uh, most creatures that even when you're looking at their other behavior they're based off when you're looking at behaviors that um, derive, come by way of things that are not derived from instinctual variances, you have to look at initial conditions within the environment, and it's the case that the behaviors of the animal are contextually based. Um, it's even like that with Skinner's rats. You only get Skinner's rats to do what Skinner's rats do when you shape the environment to be a certain way and you put the rats under a certain set of conditions. And then you can get them to act in certain ways, but it's the case that context, the context that the creature is surrounded in, dictates and determines the behavior. Context is better a better description or a better predictor for behavior in most other animals than outside of instinctual variances than anything else. And you might not be surprised by me saying this, but human beings are no different. And now we have to look at, so going from the general scope to human beings specifically, it's the case that because human beings are very strange creatures in the sense that we're um, uh, things that are mostly comprised by memory, I uh, roughly. You know, it's the case that when you're looking at a human being from a phenomenological perspective, or even how you experience another person from a phenomenological perspective, it's the case that 
typically your memory is the thing that's accounting for most of what you're seeing or dealing with when you're um, observing the person than uh, much else much el mu than much else that there could be to account for um, it's the case that and what I mean by this is that um, when you look at a person react to a certain um, a stimulus either it's novelty or history that you're seeing with the activity and how people explore things versus how they respond to things are very very different and that's the case for most animals in general now it's the case that you have things like personality for the shepherding of exploratory responses and novel problem solving and general intelligence and creativity as phenomena to deal with the factors of novelty you you winnow down the scope of novelty by having a personality and having culture as a buttress and you also use um, your capacity for general intelligence and creativity to deal with the novelty maybe not limit the novelty and put it in a certain framework in a, in a parameter but deal with it as novelty as an item and the cognitive processes as tools but outside of that when you're not dealing with novelty and you're dealing with a, um, a known stimulus you're looking at a history that is so um, uh, complex oftentimes with people that it's really hard to make out that's why you even have now there's not several studies in um, uh, well I'll say this that it's not always the case that somebody just responds the way that they do to a given um, uh, stimuli based on their um, early childhood experiences but if you want to point your fingers to what would be most influential in shaping the way that somebody is going to react to a certain stimulus it's the case that you might want to first look at early childhood experiences for the mere fact that the brain is kind of funny in the sense that context is what shapes the brain for the most part outside of uh, every behavior every behavior has a genetic component but not all of the um, uh, pie of the behavior is completely genetic some behaviors are far more genetic than others and others are not as genetic as other behaviors and that's what's making the messy business of trying to figure out the um, uh, placing of genetics in terms of you know your, our judgments of human behavior rather tricky and uh, quite a complex ordeal but it is the case that all behaviors have a genetic component to them but they also have a probabilistic component to them meaning that because the brain is something that chooses to wire itself up post birth which is very 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 strange for human beings because that's not how most other um, animals are it's the case that most other animals are basically wired up from the times that they drop from their um, uh, mu in a certain way from the, by the time they drop from the plus, um, uh, the um, uh, I'm trying to find a nice way to say this. Basically, by the time they get out of that uh, fallopian tube and, like, you know, no, I don't think they go through the fallopian tube. Excuse me, women, I don't know gynecology that well, but it's the case that I know that it comes out of the vagina, and so once they drop from uh, there and uh, the placental sac is on the ground, it's usually they're wired up as much as they're going to be. And over, over a small period of time, they're going to um, uh, wire themselves up in the way that they need to be in the environment through play and while they're being nursed but for the most part that developmental period is very very short for human beings however it's very long like ridiculously long and how helpless babies are when they come out is because they're poorly put together because you need for human beings because we're I think I only I only theorize because we're so migratory and we're some we're things that are based off of general and our levels of general intelligence and um, creativity which are general factors the and same thing about personalities and we have things like personality traits they're very general they don't tell you exactly what's going to be and exactly what's going to come about but they're so general that you can't use them honestly to make a creature up you need more to make the creature up but because we are based off of this general putty, it's the case that we need this experience, we need this extended context because 
we're migratory, we're migratory and we're general. Migratory in general, and we're general because we're migratory. Because you don't know what dominance hierarchy you're going to find yourself in. You don't know what region you're going to find yourself in as a human being. I mean, maybe your parents started in one region, but you're, birth you're birthed in another region. And so you, you need a different set of tools than your parents had whenever they made it such that they could survive that region and get to the next one. And you will not, you will inherit, you will inherit some of the great goods of your parents, but you need to develop some of the goods on your own to be able to withstand, or you need to develop some of the tools of your own to be able to, to withstand this environment. It's also why in mythological motifs that, yeah, you have the um, uh, history of your ancestors with you, but you have to do something on your own and get away from the history of your ancestors to be any kind of hero. And so it's because that's about that's a very much analogous to how it is how it is for human beings to exist. But because we are this way, we're very plastic, adaptive, general things. We have it such that our brains, well, our brains. It's not a chicken before the egg question because it's obviously what came first. You know, you had the brain. You had brains before. You, it is a chicken or the egg question because it honestly isn't like really obvious at what period in our evolutionary history this started being the case. I mean, but it had to be since you know it has to be something. It's most likely that it's something that has made us distinctly human versus any other kind of hominid. There have been multiple types of human, uh, multiple prototypes for humans, but for us to be what we are, this had to be even in some rudimentary way, the way that we've been since the beginning. Um, it's why we've been so successful. And a good, I guess, representation of this is the fact that the human brain is very poorly myelinated for the beginning of its um, uh, existence, you know, for any individual. You know, at age zero, if you're looking at the wiring in terms of the thickness of the fidelity of the white matter and the gray matter in the brain, not that great. I mean, you have a whole hell of a lot of synapses and more, um, uh, you have more synapses when you're born than when you die. You basically regress into yourself, but you're also not that efficient in terms of a system overall. And so the reason for this is, is because your brain doesn't know what environment you're going to wind up in. It doesn't know what language you're going to wind up speaking, but you're going to wind up in some environment. You're going to wind up speaking some language, and you're going to wind up having some culture that you need to be responsive towards in terms of moving yourself up a dominance hierarchy. So in order for it to account for all these things, it just makes you into basically, it makes you, your brain might as well be 10 pounds of tofu, because that's about as, like, you know, that's about as differentiated as it is. Outside of, outside of, um, uh, genetic factors and like genetic factors are there but they're not necessary to talk about really right now because we can't really parsimony like one thing we know in recent research for IQ is that it is 80% genetic 80% of the variance in terms of cognitive ability can be explained by uh, by genetic factors and that's why various program programs like Head Start and um, other um, uh, governmental and um, public programs to try to reduce the differences in academic achievement and some um, uh, groups in terms of upper class um, and, and lower class groups has not worked out so great um, because a lot of the variance is genetic as as disheartening as that might be to hear it's, it's at least what the data shows right now. If there's anything different, I don't know, but at least it's at least what the data shows right now from what I've read. And it's the case that there are a lot of things like that with human beings, but there are not as many of those things as there is for the fact that the brain is a general little plastic organ. Now, it's unfortunate that the things that aren't that susceptible to change are very deterministic, but it is the case that there's a whole lot of human beings that's not deterministic about the only thing that's deterministic is that the brain says thou shalt be and thou shalt be is very um, uh, probabilistic I mean it's basically predicated on the environment you're reared in and the stimulus you come into contact with in that environment that are more akin to the suite of your temperamental factors and are very impressionistic whether that be traumatic or highly positive but it's the case that either either of those two things will take the cake because you have 
a basically a learning mechanism that's predicated on the on the pain pleasure principle. And so you have it such that when you're looking at behavior, you have at the very beginning of somebody's life a kind of um, self-organizing process that has its initial conditions that causes the basis of this person to emerge from the time, you know, that's basically from the ages of zero to um, six years old and you're going to get differences added on as you go from um, six to nine, nine to twelve, twelve to 12 to um, uh, 14, 14 to 16, 16 to 18, um, 18, 18 to 20, and uh, eight, excuse me, 18 to 21, and 21 to 25. Um, and 25 on to 30, obviously a 30 year old is very different from a 25 year old, but I mean like in terms of the, in terms of the overall changes and how much work you need to put in, big difference, big difference when you start getting those, because the brain honestly isn't as plastic as you get older, but it's fundamentally plastic, but it's not as plastic as it was when you were obviously zero years old or um, uh, one years old. But, I, so plasticity and fluid intelligence um, diminishes with age, but it is the case that you are, you will change contextually nonetheless, and that's what behavior is mostly predicated on context, context to a strong degree and sense. And oftentimes what gives structure and context to behavior is the environmental pressures in the first place. I mean, because there's a few reasons for that. Because human beings are very much status-based, like very really, like they, they are. Um, and it's the case that we're, or we're very social. You know, I guess that's a more um, uh, appropriate way to describe it because it's not just the case. Status might be something of significant interest to human beings, but that's not the only thing that mediates this type of um, uh, emergent phenomena in human beings. It's most, it's all ultimately because we're social, and we have several contexts that we have to fit in. It's the case that. <laughs> excuse me, you have your innate predilections and dispositions, then you have your familial environment, and you must be conditioned to handle your familial environment, then you have your peer group. And it's the case that, despite, you know, um, nuclear families are rather a new conception in the sense that you have a father and a mother in the home, and they're uh, working together to raise the children. Um, it's the case that, for most of our evolutionary history, at least what we've been able to um, uh, dig up and, I guess, muse and speculate about, it's the case that kids, for the most part, when you, like if you're looking at early human beings, early human beings were very much um, pragmatist in terms of they needed to have large hunting parties and extended hunting periods, and it's the case that after the baby was nurtured for a certain amount of time um, and from their mother, they needed other means of being able to pull themselves together that was not completely dependent on the parents because the parents had responsibilities to the um, environment. It's, I mean, it might be depicted that women just stayed in caves, but that's not the case, you know, at least from what we can understand now from evolutionary history. I mean, they got together, they had their groups, and they met the tribe needs um, in various ways but they oftentimes went on gathering parties and looked for resources and other things within the environment. And they didn't have like all the kids, they didn't have all the kids trooping with them because kids are very, very costly and expensive. They need a lot of attention and they're very useless. They, they I mean, they, they really are um, for the most part. I mean, like you have some, you know, you can train them to be more useful. And there's a reason for that. But for the most part, what we've observed because of that, or at least what we speculate because of those observations, is that kids, for the most part, were stuck in groups with one another, and that's why peers are more, um, uh, that's why you're susceptible to peer pressure, because for the most part, peers are going to iron you out in terms of what you're going to be as an individual, because you're not going to exist with that higher, you're going to exist with that hierarchy that still is out there in the world right now, but you also you also need to exist with a new hierarchy that's going to emerge, 
which is going to either come from you or someone in your peer group. And so you need to be susceptible. You guys basically need to set rank, order, and dominance and like work things out amongst yourself because that's who will be selected on to create the new hierarchies and the new models and things. And that's why, for the most part, when you're looking at children, um, it's something that um, can be observed with language and, um, and uh, first-generation immigrants versus second-generation immigrants. If the parents come over speaking another language, I mean, unless the parents make an effort to teach that child that, that language, or the child has to use that language in order to um, get by in their household, for the most part, I mean, they're going to have to, they're not going to have the accent of their parents, and there is even a good chance that they're not going to even speak the language. That's why even when you get to the third generation or the fourth generation, of uh, some immigrant um, uh, individual in any nation, this has just been done in America for the most part. They may not even speak the they may they might not even speak the ori the original or the native language at all, um, and that's and they won't even have the same um, customs, attitudes, and behaviors as their um, uh, beyond temperamental variances um, from the original or the first generation. Um, and it's in that, and that's because, for the most part, peers are what educate peers. Like kids go to school and learn from one another. They don't learn from their parents for the most part. Like they don't do that without a lot of concerted effort. They don't do that. Or at least they have their things that they're going to learn from their parents, and then they have their thing, the things that they're going to learn from their peers. And there's nothing that you can do about that. Um, not, uh, I mean, like it really isn't, and it's the case. Other than choose like an appropriate peer group for your children, and that's why parents are pretty um, uh, particular about who their kids hang around with. Because I mean, like it's common wisdom that you know you basically become the sum of the five people you hang around, and it's probably not like that. It's more like the sum of a hundred people, because they're. But whatever. It's still the point is like you're the social context that you're a part of shapes so much of your behavior. It's not even funny, and. That's just, you know, as you're developing. Then when you get out into the broader world, there is a greater education in terms of the shaping of your behavior that's going to happen. And it's because you're going to live across all of these tiers of hierarchy and social interaction and behavior that you need to be very plastic and that your behavior needs to be so contextually dependent that it's not even funny. And that's why when it comes to um, uh, observation of people, Man, long, long, long-term observation and many, 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 many cases of observation is most appropriate when making a judgment because whenever you're making a judgment about, about behavior, which I don't really think you can make judgments about behavior, I mean, other than, like, the basis for it. Like, when you're talking about why a behavior might be there, I'm like... I think you can do better in determining why a behavior is there than determining what a behavior is or anything like that. Um, that's a poor statement. I don't think you could predict what a person will do unless you spend a very long time around them and observe, and observe them in a multitude of contexts. Or you have some amazing capacity for theory of mind, which is because you've observed a lot of people in multiple contexts, and so you have a general model that you apply to the specific. But for the most part, it's really, really, really difficult to predict what a person is going to do. I mean, you need to do your homework in order to be able to do that. I think you can predict when you look at a person why they might do something, why they have done something based on temperamental and genetic factors. Also, you also have to ground it in a whole other set of factors. And like getting down to uh, the root of behavior is very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Behavior, to me, is one of the most um, uh, trickiest subjects when it comes to human beings. Like, despite what anybody will tell you, because you would think, one, fun, one, human beings are very plastic, but a funny thing about them, too, is that they're not infinitely plastic. And that's one thing that has to be accounted for, that I don't think many people do. Like, you can get people to do a lot of things, but there's going to be a limit, because there is a, there's, there's constraints. And it's in human nature is that constraint, and it's the case that, and it's the case too that, as we select for a given behavior collectively as a society, we will 
make it more likely for that thing to manifest itself in the structure of our genome. Uh, that's bizarre too. But it's the case that behavior, acting a certain way, is probably what acting differently or being able to act outside of the um, instinctual variances and the behaviors of the immediate context is what allowed us what allowed us to um, have such leaps in our evolutionary history. Um, uh, and we get that from our capacity to play and from creativity and just our ability to abstract things in general, but it's the case that there are a lot of factors that influence our behavior such that I don't think that I could ever make a typological description based off of behaviorism. I mean, I don't, like, when people say that an ENTP will do this or an INTP will do this, I think that's horseshit. Like, you don't really know that. Like, maybe the ones you've seen and the ones that you've observed you that could be the case and maybe you can make a general like description for what they would be motivated to do in the environment but I think like for the most part if you look at maybe you're in maybe you're in a middle class and maybe you're in a upper middle class environment and there's a certain place you've encountered all of these people and so you see a pattern and you see a trend and you think well hell that describes the whole can, that describes the type and it's like hell no that doesn't like because it's the case that you know I don't think I think that there are some things I think the only thing that you know will look consistent is motivational schemas like the the perceptual landscape can't differ from a, for a human being because it's something of a factor of evolution and it's like you're not getting rid of that you really not it's older than it's older than Because here's the funny thing, like even lizards have behaviors, like or even lizards have personalities. If you um, uh, if you get a bunch of lizards together and you just if you want to you want to impress the idea of personality on the activity, and because you can't really understand how a lizard's motivated. I mean, like you can look at its brain and things like that, and do a whole hell of a lot of studies and see certain things about lizard behavior or activity, and you know that there are some things generally that lizards do and then there are some things that certain lizards do and when you get enough and when you look at enough lizards you see that lizards could be introverted or extroverted just like people can be there are lizards that are less likely to interact with a probe in the environment and there are lizards that are more likely to interact with a probe in the environment or um, there is lizards that are more aggressive than other lizards a lot of that's due to male, like, sexual dimorphism, but it's, I mean, like, even in the, uh, you'll get variants, because that just happens in nature for whatever reason, and because there's variances in the ways that things can be deposed to act on the world and respond to how the world's acting on it, and this thing is older than, um, uh, mammals, it's the case that temperamental variances in, um, their connectivity to behavior is freaking old, and it's like, and motivation, the motivational systems in terms of the drives and um, in terms of the um, substrates that animate you is also older than like conscious old little you. And it's the case that you won't... Well, it's just the case that, you know, that's something you c is more reliable in terms of an indicator for why something is the case than... Um, uh, context, like the immediacy of context, because even though our behavior is predicated on context, our motivations are not, and that's why human beings are irrational, and they do stupid things, because you would think, you know, given the context of this, that's unnecessary, but that behavior, oftentimes when you're seeing, oftentimes when you're seeing behavior like that, or predictably irrational behavior, that has nothing to do with the immediacy of anything, it has everything to do with an evolutionary landscape that we're no longer a part of. And that's why human beings have a hard time in making decisions and making and long-term planning and functional action in the world that doesn't seem absolutely stupid. I mean, like, if I'm being frank. And that's the reason why. Because motivation, for the most part, is not contextually based. It's not contextually based at all. But behavior is. Oh, that was a nice save. Reflexes. But behavior is. But that's why it's also compellingly confusing to try and uh, make out descriptions of people 
based on their behavior. I mean, like it's it really is without a long um, without a long um, period of analyses. I and mean, I mean, like a long period of analyses. And it's also the case that, um, uh, well, yes, this is why I take the phenomenological approach rather than the behavioristic approach. And it's also why there's a problem with most things you read on um, uh, most websites about um, uh, any one type. I mean, like that's that's why it can seem very horse horoscopish and um, uh, just too nebulous because if you try to generalize behavior behavior you basically have nothing meaningful like you really don't um, because you can basically train or teach a person to do a lot of things anything that you would say is specific to that uh, that type and it's also the case that you can make it such that if you put a person in a stressful enough environment or a motivating enough environment that you can get them to act in a hundred and one ways. You can get them to act in a lot of ways. And it's also the case that anytime you think that a human being won't do something, you just have not found the right motivations in order to elicit that sort of response or thing in a person. Now there's differences and thresholds to um, certain stimuli and um, phenomena in the environment, but that behavior, I mean, the ability for them to respond to it is always there because if they didn't have it they wouldn't exist or they'd be very very different like there's you know there's a reason why asexuality is a mutation rather than an affect or a um, uh, there are asexual people in the world but there's a reason why it's a mutation because it's the case that if somebody's not interested in sex they're less likely to make it such that they their genes are make they're not gonna like unless they're raped or something like that their genes unless they're a woman and they're raped their genes are not going to make it to the um, uh, next generation and it's also why you have it such that some personality disorder that's why personalities some personality disorders are considered um, uh, malignant or um, uh, not beneficial because it's the case that you create because the model of something being beneficial, there's a lot of people that would say, well, the world's overpopulated in the first place, so it's very useful for asexual people to be around, or personality disorders um, uh, that make people behave asexually to be around, but it's the case that if you don't have sex as a motivator, human beings don't do a lot of shit. Like, they really don't. Uh, they don't do a lot of things. So as much as you don't like overpopulation, I mean, it's the case that you don't have the human animal being what it is if you don't have the drives and the motivation to make it what it is and it's also the case that when you take away that drive you make a human being more susceptible to things that you wouldn't want them to be susceptible to like antisocial behavior um, and um, uh, depression and mood disorders I mean like it's the case that yeah sex makes life better it's like even though it has all these problematic elements to it it makes life better on the whole <laughs> funnily enough um, and it's the case that anything that's like this, you better believe that nature did not leave it to chance or to just pure plasticity. Um, and those are the only things I think that you can know for a, a greater degree of certainty that you could that you can predicate a model on. And so it's the case too that when you're looking at and it's also the case too that when you're looking at your own behaviors, don't be so sure that. Um, uh, that's a description of your personality because I think that people use that as an excuse oftentimes in terms of uh, being amenable to change or persuasion I mean behaviors are rather difficultly instantiated but it's the case that they're they're very much contextually based whether whether you want to believe that or not it is the case and you can do things to shape your environment such that you will be less likely to continue to do a behavior a very good example is smoking. I mean, it's not the case that it's easy to quit smoking, but I dare you to do something. Throw out all the cigarettes that you have or nicotine products that you have in your house and disassociate with every person that you know that smokes. I mean, yeah, you're going to go through chemical withdrawals for a certain amount of time, but make it such that you have um, uh, make it such that you have plenty of sex as you as this is occurring. Give yourself a uh, give yourself a uh, 
diet rich in um, uh, fruits and um, vegetables for um, uh, good, good balanced sugars that don't um, dysregulate your mood and make it such that you run and you drink a lot of water and I promise you, you will find it that you will not at least be feeling compelled to smoke. It will be your choice then after. I think for at least like six weeks or something like that, four to six weeks. But it's the case that even something like that, it's very, it's very much the case that it's contextually dependent. It's very contextually dependent. Same thing if you have a sugar problem. Just get rid of all the sugar that you have in your house and stop hanging out with people that make it such that you are more likely to consume sugar. And I promise you, your tendency to want to consume sugar will diminish or drastically in any kind of like behavior that you, because there's a whole suite of behaviors that you, you can tie to any kind of compulsory or impulsive thing or um, addiction. And it's the case that all behaviors that were predicated, and that's the funny thing too about behaviors, they're very much predicated on the um, uh, basis of networks in your brain. I mean, like, whether or not you're talking to a person when they're angry or when they're sad or when they're whatever, this way or that way, or whenever they're re-experiencing something that they experienced when they were younger. I mean, fuck, like, the lit, it's like, it's a great list of things that you could potentially be seeing with the behavior. But it's the case that all of those things are contextually dependent for the most part. And you can make it. You and that's why. Um, that's the only reason why psychology is. You. That's the only reason why psychology is useful, and it gets results. Is because the, it's the case that human beings are like this. Um, they're not endlessly manipulable, but it's the case that a lot of behavior is contextually based. A lot of it's contextually based, and it's the case that whenever you're looking at a person, keep that in mind. Also, when you're looking at what uh, when a person doing something. You might want to ask the why for it rather than looking at the what. The like what a person is doing is probably if you're wanting to make a moral judgment about that person, it's probably not as salient as why they're doing something or why they're motivated to do something. It's also how you can be a better judge of your own your own actions and how you can be a better judge of other people's actions. And if you want to it's also why we don't trust con artists and things like that, because con artists are nice, like they're eliciting a certain set of behaviors that we find um, rather pleasing, but we can kind of smell in the air in terms of, you know, our fuzzy logic that all of these factors don't add up, so there has to be something else to this that makes it such that I should not trust this person. But that's also why people get over, that's also why there are con artists in the world and why people can, why they can get over on people, because people are very much based on the now in terms of the observation of what. And they don't go further in terms of asking, like, what, why might that thing be making, why might that thing be manifesting itself in the world in the way that it is, that it is right now in this given context? Like, that's very important. But that's how all behavior is. That's like how all behavior, that's how all aspects of behavior is. Because not all behave, behavior is not 100% um, uh, contextually dependent. There is a portion of any one behavior that is genetically dependent, but anytime you're looking at things that are not genetic, whenever you're looking at what's not the genetic basis for this, you're looking at context. And context might not be in the immediate sense of the word, like if you're talking about trauma or you're talking about a very um, uh, fulfilling positive experience whenever they're, like, I mean, like the like like women like female masturbation is a great example of this because females who masturbate when they're adults the likelihood that they learn to masturbate when they're young and I mean like really young is much higher and it, not all women masturbate and it's also why women can be crabby <laughs> like because if women masturbated they I think that they would be in less they would find more mood regulation in their life like they really would but it's the case that not all most women. I'm not going to say most women don't masturbate, but a lot of women don't masturbate. I don't know the statistics for that. But I know that for the women that do masturbate, typically they masturbated at a far early age than they did, they did then. Or they, were, they discovered that their lady parts made them feel good at a very early age. Whether that was with a um, uh, bathtub spray or something, like on accident typically. Or they laid in a certain way, like on their hand, or they encountered like they encountered a um, uh, a table or something like it 
pressed against the private in the right way, and there you go. You have, uh, you have their, you have women masturbate, but it's not like typically when they do that. Typically, if they do that, it was like it was at an early age, cause like, or they had a very real experience. I mean, like. You know, because there's a lot of women that are go that will go for sex, but they don't particularly go for masturbation, and like that's very perplexing. But one of the hypotheses why that's the case is because, at least statistically, when they figure out like, okay, these women masturbate, and they ask them, well, when did you start masturbating? Man, some women learn to masturbate, or they learn the sensitivity of their privates in terms of pleasure from the ages of three and four and five and six years old at a very early age, and those are the women, lo and behold, that masturbate when they're older. Well, even when you're looking at that behavior, like even. That's an example of a positive, rewarding behavior that they keep up. When you're even looking at something like that, context may not even be in the now. Like, and that context is not always embedded in the now, but there is some context behind any behavior, and thus behavior is heavily con contextually um, dependent. So that's my video, on and that's also why you should stop the stupid analyses based on behavior. Like, I hate that. Like, because it's very, very. You don't know what you think. You don't know what you think you know. You don't. Like, you really don't. But, okay. And so that's my, that's my video on behavior. Hopefully you found that interesting, and thank you for watching.